In the spirit of respect, reciprocity, and truth, we honor and acknowledge Mokinsis, the traditional Treaty 7 territory, and oral practices of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Sitka, the Kainai, the Pekani, as well as the Stony Nakoda First Nations, including Bears Paw, Chiniki, Good Stony First Nations, and the Satina Nation. We acknowledge this territory as the homeland of the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, within this historic Northwest Métis homeland, whose footsteps have marked the lands for centuries. And we acknowledge people, both Indigenous and non. As a borrower of this land, I want to just take a brief moment and talk about my journey towards truth and reconciliation. I understand with great privilege comes great responsibility. Responsibility to educate myself on the authentic and difficult truths of our past. My responsibility to make sure that Indigenous communities have the same privilege that I've been afforded for all my years. My journey took a turn about a year ago. About a year ago, I realized that I was of Métis ancestry, an ancestry that was hidden from me for three generations. It was hidden from me so that I could grow up with privilege, so I could grow up free from harm that many Indigenous people faced. This revolution, uh, revelation has had a profound impact on myself. There's often times I ask myself, what if? What if my mother or grandmother were forced into residential schools? What if my brother was taken as part of the 60s scoop? What if the promises that I was told to believe in were continually broken? At the same time, I feel blessed. I feel blessed to learn about a part of my history, part of who I am that I didn't know. I'm proud to be able to watch my daughters embrace their Indigenous heritage and celebrate their heritage moving forward. At the same time, I realize we have to and can do more. My call to action is to pick up where others have left off, to carry the torch. I will do so by making sure we empower and support Indigenous businesses and entrepreneurs at every chance we get. I will continue to be a champion for truth and reconciliation calls to action with the progressive uh, Aboriginal relationship program across ATB. I can and will continue to speak out about my history and what I've learned. June is National Indigenous History Month. It's a time for all of us to take the opportunity as treaty people to reflect, to think about the truths, the difficult truths of our history, to educate ourselves moving forward. We all have a responsibility and we've made great strides over the last number of years, but there's a number of strides left to go. With that, uh, I'm excited to call our first panel to the stage. Please join me in welcoming Joan Hertz, the chair of ATB Financial, Curtis Stange, our president and CEO, and Dan Hugo, our chief financial officer. Welcome. Hey, Chris. Thank you. With you. Have Rose I told you how much I appreciate you, Chris, lately? Yeah. Thanks, Lord. You are our best group head of business we have at the company. <laughs> I'm listening. I'm listening. Um, so welcome. So one of the great things I get to do with my job is I get a chance to go out and uh, spend time with businesses all across the province. Large businesses, small, public, private businesses, uh, non-for-profit, for-profit, all sorts of businesses. In the last year, there's been a number of challenges that uh, businesses uh, have faced. Even talking to a number of clients this morning, probably four or five sort of key challenges that are on uh, the top of people's minds. I know, Curtis, for us in the banking world, there's a number of challenges that we faced and, and one towards the end of the year that we didn't anticipate. And that was uh, what we saw with some of the regional banks down in the US. Some near collapses and some actually collapses of regional banks. We also saw the major banks in Canada just recently release earnings which weren't as strong. All of these things tend to lead to tightening of credit policies. So with all of the different challenges, with what we've seen with uh, some of the bank uh, collapses and near collapses, what does that mean for ATB? 
Thanks, Chris, and uh, great to see everyone today. Thanks very much for joining us for this second annual uh, ATB Business Summit. Great to see everybody. Um, I think I'd start with, uh, I've had the great opportunity to work across many of the provinces in this country. I've led some um, uh, portfolios by uh, working with businesses directly in my early years of my career in BC, worked a lot of years in Alberta, Saskatchewan, I uh, spent four years in Toronto where bankers have to go through Bay Street, spent four years in Ottawa. And I can say that unequivocally, uh, the business leaders in Alberta are the most resilient, hardworking, innovative, entrepreneurial spirited leaders that I've come across. Clearly, bar none, Alberta has that fabric of hard work and resilience built within it. And similar to your comments, uh, what these business leaders have required for now 85 years to your opening comments has been a bank that's worked alongside of them. And ATB Financial has been there. Uh, you know, we were born, to Chris's point, out of the ashes of the Great Depression, September 29th, uh, 1938. We're going to turn 85 uh, this September 29th. And we have been with Alberta businesses. We were created simply because some of our competitor banks choose to distribute their balance sheet and their capital and their investment where they get the best returns. So they maximize profit. And when you maximize profit, it's not a bad thing. However, the outcome of that is that you will move and you will impact your client base and in many cases your employees with where you can get the best possible return. So at that time, back in 1938, there were the central banks who were moving their money back to higher growth areas in the country that happened to be Ontario, and specifically the big industry in Alberta at the time was agriculture. So the province set up uh, ATB Financial. And for the last 85 years, we've been there. We've been there through fires. We've been there through floods. We've been there through droughts. We've been there through various economic cycles. And uh, we will continue to be there. And uh, that's just something, the essence of who we are as an organization. We're very committed to Alberta and Alberta businesses and, Albert and Albertans themselves, and we will be there. So that, you know, you have our word, Joan, the board, is very encouraging of management to make sure that we stay committed to uh, the province of Alberta and the businesses through good times and bad. I'd like to just pivot a little bit, if I could, and, and answer it in, in, a, in, a, in a slightly different way from an industry perspective. And I shared this with the board uh, most recently at our Q4 meetings in May. And that is that um, the good news is that Canadians uh, actually get to enjoy safe, stable banking. You know, uh, the Canadian banking industry itself, while the banks redeploy capital across the country in different jurisdictions based on return, um, what they are is they're safe and stable and you can trust them. You know, you can trust data, you can trust the fact that the, the Canadian has a good banking system. To me, there's an and to that. And each time that the Canadian banking system is not impacted by a banking crisis, actually builds their resolve to not innovate, to not be productive, and to be high cost. So you should know that banking enjoys in Canada the highest uh, return on equity of any banking jurisdiction globally. Our ROE of the Canadian banking system is higher than the UK banks, it's higher than the Australian banks, it's higher than the US banks, it's higher than the Chinese banks, and it's simply because the oligopoly in all of its benefits has a very strong influence on federal governments. And an example of that is open banking. And open banking and open payments are two regulatory advancements that the industries across the globe have advanced far quicker than Canada. Uh, you as business leaders move money every single day. And in Canada, yes, can we do it in a safe and secure way? Yes, you expect that. But you pay on average more than what your business colleagues would do in other jurisdictions around the world, and they're typically a bit slower. And so there's payment modernization that's happened around the globe that's moving a little bit slower in Canada. Open banking is another one. It was put in the March 2018 federal budget, and it's really moved quite slow, partly because of the pandemic, but partly because the oligopoly, good, and the fact that they've got a lot of influence over the federal government and the regulators. And open banking would be good for business. It would be good for consumers. It essentially gives you to, the ability to control your data. 
and in other jurisdictions, what we found around the world is that you could define for your bank, if you happen to bank at multiple banks, you could uh, 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 let those banks know and inform those banks that they have to share your data. And when they can share your data, it's a better experience for you. You control that, you own your data, it's sovereign data, but you can control it. So you saw switching costs go down, you saw the, the cost of payments go down, payments happened a lot quicker, and these, this, this advancements in regulatory uh, 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 reform has happened in other banking jurisdictions around the world. So it's a double-edged sword. We're safe, we're secure, we, we are not impacted as meaningfully as other banking jurisdictions around the world, and the downside to that is we move slower, we're less innovative, we're less productive, and the profitability of banks in Canada is, uh, is quite high. So it's a double-edged sword. You know that ATB Financial um, will represent Alberta business in a very meaningful way. We just have, through the Sustainable Finance Action Council, where the feds are looking at setting up a taxonomy for the capital markets to define where investment will go in Canada. And ATB Financial uh, was a big influencer in that federal taxonomy and the principles around that taxonomy that actually had them take a pause on the taxonomy, which actually didn't include any natural gas and it didn't include any carbon offset, which is quite ridiculous. And uh, we now know that the federal government is looking at those two things as it crafts uh, a, a, a Canadian taxonomy for the capital markets. We'll do the same thing as we influence and punch above our weight with the federal regulators in Ottawa and the big banks in Toronto to make sure that we can help drive this industry to where it needs to get to. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Perfect. A, a couple of things. Uh, as CEO, feel free to, to pivot as many times as you would like and <laughs> also feel free to take as much time as you yeah, would like. Yeah, so uh, yeah. I think we covered a number of questions there. This could well, go I'm quite done. quick the rest of the day. I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, shocking. I think people are shocked I did that. <laughs> Dan, Curtis talked about being there for Albertans and being there for Albertans for the last 85 years. You need a strong position to be there for uh, Alberta and Alberta uh, businesses. So when you look at our position that we're in today, how were we positioned to be able to support Alberta businesses going forward? No, no, thank you for the question. And as Curtis mentioned, uh, ITB is very similar to the province. If the province does well, so does ITB and vice versa. And so this year, I, and we actually also learn about it uh, in the next presentation with Mark on the outlook on the economy, Alberta did better than most of Canada. So from that side, ATB's results reflected that as well. We had this year record revenues of $1.9 billion. We also had record net income before provision of $581 million. That said, also this year, when you look at our income statement, you'll see last year we had a reversal of provision, loan loss provision. This year we actually had a small increase, but it's still very moderate. So overall, this, the economy in Alberta is strong, and we haven't really seen any of the pressures that we would normally expect with higher interest rates or inflation. There are a few data points that I uh, I think the board and management uh, jokes with me. There are certain slides I love, and I keep bringing it up because it's, it's the just, just such, such good messaging. And so Curtis mentioned when we became a Crown Corporation 25 years ago, when we start looking at that time period and say how much did our net income before provision grow, and our overall growth rate from a and your sort of compound growth rate was 7%, where Alberta's growth rate was only like 2.7%. So we essentially, from a performance side, outperformed the economy threefold, which is for me something to be really proud of. And then the last piece, we've heard a lot about Silicon Valley Bank and we've actually heard a lot about some of the banking struggles. Looking at our capital, We've built our capital to a record level. So we are currently the highest of any mid-sized bank in Canada. Our capital levels are actually stronger than both CIBC and the Bank of Nova Scotia. Think about that, the bank, mid-sized bank here in Alberta being able to do that 
actually gives me a lot of pride and so thankful to be part of the ATB family. That's a tremendous success story. I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> what I'll take away from that from an ATB business standpoint is we're open for business, we're able to do business and excited to continue to support Alberta companies. So Joan, you recently got back from Toronto where uh, you were the 2023 WXN, Canadian Diversity and Inclusion Chair uh, of the Year. So congratulations. Once again, yeah. Uh, the Board of Directors plays such an important role when it comes to governance. Uh, why is governance so important today with all of the challenges and all of the complexity that companies are facing? Yeah, I think we, you know, they've both spoken about the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and some of the other banks, and I think a lot of that starts with governance. Do you have uh, the right competence around the board table? Do you have uh, board members with financial, legal, business, uh, industry experience, in our case banking, do you have that kind of expertise around the table? And then are you implementing strong governance systems with risk oversight, with strategic focus? Are you focusing on the future? Are you thinking about what uh, the implications are of the big decisions that you're making? That's governance, that's it. And so I can say with confidence, I can give uh, everyone here confidence that we do have that diverse set of expertise and competence around the board table at ATB. Although we are saying goodbye to two of them, I'm going to mention quickly Rob Pierce and Diane Petty, both excellent board members for many years, so thank you so much for your service. But we have a great uh, set of board members around the table, and that's step one, having the right people around the table, and then step two is getting the right systems in place. That's governance. So not all the companies uh, out here will have a formal board of directors. From their perspective, uh, what are some systems of governance, or maybe just talk a little bit about governance for some of the companies that uh, are with us today that don't have the formal structure of a board? It entirely, you know, the hilarious thing that so many people uh, come to me and, and they're like, well, I have a 300-page governance module mo or <laughs> policy, so I must have great governance. Honestly, I say throw it away. If you can't put it on one page, if you can't understand why you need it and what its purpose is, then you probably don't need it at all. But I think all of us need to be thinking about the future. So is there a succession plan? Is there transition plan? Do you have... Have you had the deep thinking about the future as we have uh, on the strategic side and on how you're going to manage your risks? And now today, ESG. This is a, a huge wave that is coming at all of us and that is a huge part of what a board of directors can do and manage through good governance systems. Perfect. So as part of governance, we've seen lots of conversations, Curtis, have started to change. It's no longer about how do we drive as much short-term profit at all costs? You see much more talk about sort of how do we balance multiple stakeholders moving forward in today's environment. As you look ahead, not just from an ATB standpoint, but would love to hear about what ATB is doing to, to sort of balance multiple stakeholders. But for everyone, how important is, is it to balance multiple stakeholders moving forward? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah, I would, I would I'll sort of answer it and probably take a little less time than I did on the first question. <laughs> um, but I'll answer it in two different ways. Put myself in the shoes of the audience and then sort of give you where we, how we look at it from an ATB perspective. And in many cases, stakeholders and the new sort of last decade, I would say, has been purpose-driven organizations. And I, I, think, I think words are just words, but I think successful organizations like the businesses that are in the room today look at treating stakeholders in a very empathetic, effective way and manner, and don't just try and maximize the bottom line in the, in the deficit of other stakeholder groups. So for us, we happen to look at four primary stakeholder groups uh, across ATB. One is our team members, one is our clients, uh, one is the economics, obviously the value we create, and then the fourth is greater good that we call it. It's beyond banking. It's what, are, what value are we creating for four and a half million Albertans. So if I look through sort of those four stakeholder groups, there's other stakeholder groups we have. We've got vendors, we've got suppliers that we treat with respect and, and in an effective way. 
but we really focus on the outcomes of these four stakeholders. And I think, you know, we proudly have a culture of envy at ATB that we spend a lot of time in, and we would be one of the top places to work in Canada. We think that having an engaged team member, we have a proprietary metric that we've developed, and it's, a, it's called G, our Cultural Health Index, and it measures uh, team members' ability to perform, how they're thriving, and how they're adapting. And we proudly spend a lot of time nurturing and evolving the culture that is ultimately enabling a better experience for all of you as our clients. Because fundamentally, our client stakeholder group is why we exist. All of you in the room is why we exist. And in fact, our strategy is fundamental to differentiate uh, ourselves from our competitors in the experience we deliver to you. That could be through trusted financial advice, or it could th be through one of our digital properties where you have consistently remarkable experiences that are dependable. That fundamentally is how we differentiate from our competitors. So our client group, we spend an awful lot of time talking about client systems, building the capability of our team members, how we deliver that experience, the types of products, the types of availability that we have, investment in technology that brings that client system, that stakeholder group to life for us. Thirdly is the economic. Dan talked about it. We are a for-profit. I am a market capitalist. The board has expectations on returns. Uh, our shareholder has expectations on returns. In fact, we drive towards optimization of our profitability is a word that we use. So we have to maintain similar performance as our peer group at or above our peer group in a risk-adjusted way, which is really important for us. And then finally, the fourth stakeholder group, again, is what we call the greater good. It's the four and a half million Albertans that we serve beyond banking. And we believe, we have a hypothesis that actually um, what you do in your core business is important and future clients of yours will join your organization for what you do beyond your core value proposition. So if our core value proposition is banking, what do we do beyond banking that actually adds value uh, and creates value more broadly for the communities we serve. And so we would have refined our approach and focused on things like access to mental health, for example. So we are a company that is committed to wellness. We have a lot of investment in the financial, the spiritual, the um, uh, mental and the physical wellness of our team members. It's a big part of our culture of who we are. And we want to extrapolate that support on the mental health side and access to mental health. So we would put a lot of our donations, our sponsorships, our philanthropic giving towards access to mental health supports because ultimately we believe that we can help raise the well-being of Albertans. And that will be good as the full cycle goes for us as a bank, but it will also be a demonstration that we can go beyond banking to create value and provide value to this province beyond our core value proposition of banking. So that's important for us. So that by definition for us is a purpose-driven organization. And uh, you know, I think again, because we don't just simply exist for one stakeholder and that's our shareholder, we actually exist and create value for many more stakeholders and we do it in balance uh, and in service to one another. It's great, I'll even reflect back over the 85 years, you could say that's why ATB was created to find balance across multiple stakeholders. Yeah, exactly, and sorry Chris, but, and, and more and more, I actually hear from our clients, uh, that's, that's one of the reasons they join us, right? So, so table stakes is, in all your businesses, what you do is your core value proposition, whether you're in construction, you're in transportation, you're in logistics, you're in what, whatever the industry, energy, oil and gas, whatever energy industry you represent, your core value proposition is, is what gathers you clients, hangs on to your clients, drives your profitability, and Again, there are more and more clients that are joining us because of our purpose-driven approach and our approach to the communities that we serve and the stakeholders that we have with us. So Joan, I'm not gonna let you off the hook. You, you did mention ESG, so I'm gonna go uh, back there. We just released our first sustainability update. Uh, about a year ago, we hired our, our very first chief sustainability officer and Stuart McKellar, which was very exciting uh, from that perspective. Uh, maybe just talk a little bit more about why ESG is important from a board perspective and what companies that are joining us today, what they should be looking for from an ESG perspective. And I have all the rest of the time. Well, 
I'm trying to limit the time for one last question. Just kidding. I won't kill you. Uh, we're very excited about releasing our sustainability update later today. And I think that, as Curtis mentioned, uh, what ATB is doing is truly punching above its weight. We are involved on national task forces and national boards that are figuring out what these new standards are going to look like and how ESG is going to be um, unveiled to us and how we're supposed to be uh, reporting on it in our financial statements. So I'm very proud of the team and the impact that you've been able to have. So thank you all for that. And likewise, so we're looking at ourselves. So what, what's, what are we doing from an E, S, and G perspective? And I think a, a couple of examples on the S side, just looking at how diverse is your team? How diverse is your board? So we've been able to achieve 50-50 uh, gender representation on our board by finding highly qualified, competent board members and achieving 50-50 diversity. So can you do that? Can you do that on all of your teams? What about representation from other groups? What about, uh, you know, in uh, our case, we're also working very hard on reconciliation. As you mentioned in your opener, Chris, I think the partnership that we have with the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation, AIOC, uh, is pretty exciting. Like we're doing some really big project finance that's driving business across the province with an Indigenous focus. And so I think those are some examples of the S and the G. And on the E, we have looked at ourselves and said, what is our footprint and how can we change that? And, and there's little things that we can do from a power usage perspective or how we're using fuel and that's great. But I think the key thing is at the board level and at that highest senior leadership level, we created a principal statement and a policy. And that statement talks about how we are in a uniquely ATB way in a uniquely Alberta way, going to be supporting all of Alberta's diverse businesses as we integrate ESG into everything that we do. And I think similarly, that's how we can all as businesses think about how we integrate ESG into our plans. I love and I know we spent a lot of time talking about um, from an E standpoint, supporting all businesses uh, through that sort of trajectory or that path forward. Dan, Joan talked about uniquely Alberta. I talked about this uniqueness of being Alberta, this attitude. Curtis also mentioned that. At the same time, our capital markets team has an office in Toronto, has an office in New York, in Denver. And just recently, we announced that our, our ATB wealth offering would be going outside of uh, the province. Maybe just take a, a minute or two and talk about the significance of that and how that, what meaning does that have for Albertans? Uh, I have to say, this doesn't feel that dissimilar than normal, where the CEO spends money or time and the CFO <laughs> trying to save money or time. <laughs> uh, so, you know, and it's actually, we are really excited with the, our wealth offering going out of the province. It's such a great product. And, and if you've got a great product, there's a huge demand for it. And people actually want to be part of the, uh, be part of the story. So our Compass fans, as an example, two of our Compass fans for 11 consecutive years were rated basically grade A funds. So a really good story. And having such a good product, it's something that we feel there could be a broader demand for it. But the question would be is what's in it for Alberta and Albertans? And I think it is, as a mid-sized bank, scale will always be important to us. And how can we actually drive scale? By having better scale, we will be actually be able to provide even better products and better service to Albertans. So that is part of what we want to do export this great product, but at the same time leverage that to actually create scale and actually just provide better service and products to Albertans. Perfect, thanks. Curtis, I'll leave the final question for yourself. Today's environment is uh, more complex than ever before, more uncertain, more volatile, but there's also more choice. You talked about open banking creating choice. Um, so why ATB? There's lots of choice, uh, why ATB? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would again put my sort of self in the shoes of the audience here and think about 
like I have many conversations, I had a conversation with Tim Logal just earlier over coffee about their competitive differentiation and how they engage the clients in the, in the development of their product. And each one of you would have, whether you've declared it or not, you would have an intentional strategy about how you're deploying your resources. And whether that is in um, you're deciding to be a low cost producer of the good or, or the service that you provide, you're differentiated based on product, you might have a niche client segment that you go after, you might have geographical regions where your competitors don't go and you compete there. Um, you know, there's a variety of ways that you can compete and strategically our differentiation, in our opinion, as I mentioned, has to be grounded in all of you. It has to be grounded in our clients because to Dan's point, we're a regional bank, so we don't necessarily have scale. We can't necessarily be a low cost provider of the good. So our efficiency ratio is going to be, you know, at the top end of, of the range because of who we are and our commitment broadly to the communities that we serve across Alberta. We can't have product differentiation for any great length of time in the banking business. There's lots of investment in technology and those products are copied uh, quite, 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 quite openly. We are expanding our value proposition. Um, as Chris mentioned, we've got offices in the US and our capital market business is North American wide. We purchased a boutique investment bank back in March of 2020, right at the beginning of the pandemic, and now we're scaling our wealth offer uh, outside of the province and we'll be open in BC and Saskatchewan uh, this summer and then this fall. But at the end of the day, what we fundamentally have to be different on is a couple of things. One is the experience that we deliver to you through our trusted advice, and that we will be there alongside of you through your growth cycles, through your uh, challenging cycles that you hit within the industry that you happen to serve, and we will be consistent and we will be that financial partner that understands you better than any other bank in Canada. And the good news for us is that lots of decisions of the national, national banks are centralized to Eastern Canada, and in fact, they don't understand Alberta businesses, and they don't understand the cycles that we go through economically, and the fabric and the hardworking resilience of what makes us Alberta, and ATB Financial gets it. We are not perfect. We are not perfect. We're, on a, a, we're entering into the fourth year of a 10-year strategy that we built alongside the board, and, uh, and, I, and I would say we're in a good spot. We're, we're proud of and humbled by our uh, cultural uh, diversity and the fact that we are held up as one of the top places to work in Canada. Uh, we, have, we win awards nationally for the advice and the experience that we deliver to our clients through third parties. We've got economically one of the strongest balance sheets in the country uh, and our greater good strategy is getting its stride and we're just getting started. This is the exciting part that I think as we deploy our strategy through what we call the middle innings and into the late innings in these future years, you're going to see an ATB that's just going to continue to get better. We're going to invest in our people, invest in our leaders that will uh, uh, extrapolate to a better experience for all of you as business leaders and we can't wait to continue to grow with you and have you challenge us at the same time as we uh, uh, look at challenging all of our competitors through delivering consistently remarkable experiences every single day. So, very exciting.